Good morning. Good morning. Uh, don't forget, uh, just quickly, uh, that the, the box for uh, crop walk envelopes is, is in the entryway, so bring those with you if you haven't turned them in yet. If you have any questions or concerns about that, talk to John and Karen Schmidt. They can help you out with that. I uh, also want to make a quick announcement. I got a phone call yesterday, actually, when I was mowing the lawn, um, uh, which was scary because it was my 24-hour emergency number, so I was, I was a little uh, worried about that, but it was uh, Karen Vandervoort giving me a call. She wanted to let me know, she just couldn't hold it in any longer, that she is cancer free. She got some recent blood tests and scans and they show the cancer has gone away. And that is wonderful news. She went through a very specialized treatment at uh, the Cleveland Clinic and uh, it really worked. Um, so send her a card, give her a call, give her a word of congratulations, that is good news. Uh, I was really happy to hear that. So we were chatting while I was sitting in the corner of my yard, and I can't even imagine what the neighbors were thinking because uh, I was pumping my arms up and down, uh, excited. Uh, so they think I'm weird anyway, so it's fine. Today is World Communion Sunday. It is the day that in the Christian world, we know that we are all coming and gathering together uh, at the table. So I wear this very special stole. It was handmade, hand-sewn, or uh, hand-woven, actually, uh, by workers, artisans in Honduras. And so this uh, stole I wear once a year to remember all the people of the world uh, as we gather at the table with our sisters and brothers, wherever they may be on this day. So friends, we worship our God, not just by ourselves here or online, but we worship with Christians all around the world as we gather at the table. Friends, let us gather our hearts and minds together and let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we desire or we even deserve. Pour, on, uh, pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us all those things of which our conscience is afraid, giving us all those good things that we aren't even worthy to ask for, Loving and merciful God, join us together with our sisters and brothers around the world as we gather at your table this day. Draw us together in the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, our psalm today is Psalm 26, verses 1 through 12. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord Without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners nor my life with the bloodthirsty, those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me. Be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. Friends, let's stand and join our voices together with our first song, Almighty.
Yeah, please be seated. Would our young disciples like to come forward? You got all your friends today. How do you guys feel when you do something really, really good, somebody else does something really, really bad, and they get away with it? Think of it like this. Maybe you do something really, really good to help mom and dad out, but your sibling, your sister or brother, doesn't do such a good thing, but they don't get in any trouble. And if you do something like that, you'll get in a lot of trouble. How do you feel? You feel mad. There you go. Yeah, you feel really upset by that. This used to happen. My brother is six years older than I am. And so when we were growing up, he would always get in trouble for stuff. But I somehow got yelled at for it. I didn't do it. I was doing exactly what I was told to do. I did my chores, or I did my homework. I did whatever I was supposed to do, kept my nose out of it. But somehow I still got in trouble. There's this guy that lived, his name was Job. And Job was a really, really, really good guy. He did really good stuff. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. But then some really bad stuff happened to him. And his friends came and they said, Job, you must have done something wrong. And another one of his friends said, well, your kids, who all got in some trouble, your kids were really bad people, Job. You deserved all of this. And Job was really mad about all of this because he was a good guy. He did what he was supposed to do. Do you think it's okay that we get mad? Yeah, it's okay to get mad. It's okay to get upset. We can't live that way. Nobody will want to be our friend if we're mad all the time, right? It's okay to feel the things that we feel. Job felt mad, and that's okay. God said that that was okay to Job. He understood. He was upset. And it's okay when we're upset. But we should talk about it. We should talk. If we're mad with God, we should talk to God about that. If we're mad with mom and dad, we should talk to mom and dad. We shouldn't yell. We shouldn't stomp or throw things, but we should talk to mom and dad because we still want to have a relationship. Job talked a lot to God, and that was okay. God said, thank you for talking to me about everything that's bothering you. And God blessed Job. So it's okay to feel mad sometimes. We just have to talk about it. All right, let's pray. God, when we are mad, let us be able to talk to you. Let us be able to talk to our mom and dad. Let us be able to talk to the person that we're mad with. God, help us when we're mad. Show us your love so that we know we're loved even if we're feeling kind of mad. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. All throughout this month, we're going to take a quick, a very quick walk through Job. I encourage you um, on the weeks uh, when we don't necessarily read the whole book of Job, I do encourage you to read Job in your spare time. It's a fantastic book. There's so much going on. It's actually one of my favorite books altogether that's in Scripture. This week, we hear from the very beginning of Job. Next week, we're going to hear from Job 23, right in the middle. And then the third week, we're going to jump right to the end. There's, Job is a very long book, so we can't read. I mean, we'd be here for months reading through it. But I encourage you to do read that in your spare time. Get a sense of the whole story that's going on. But this morning, we're going to hear from the first chapter, the introduction and prologue. And then we're going to hear from chapter 2, which also serves uh, as an introduction. So we start first at Job 1.1. 1, 1. 
There once was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There was no one like him on the earth, a blameless, an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with, with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Friends, would you pray with me for just one moment? Lord, speak to these people whom you love through your most imperfect vessel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I first got into emergency medicine, I learned a lot of science and technique and uh, protocols and medications and all sorts of things. And when I took my final exam for the class, I, I thought, I'm prepared, I am ready to deal with any emergency that may come my way. The very day that my instructor called me and told me that I had passed both the written and the skills portion of the exam, not five minutes later, the department that I was with down in Pittsburgh, we got tapped out for the first medical call that I'd ever gone on. I did not want to go on that call because it all came full circle, it all came to reality. Oh no, it's all real. There's real human beings on the other side of all this theory and education. There's people's lives, people's loved ones. We were dispatched to the local primary care office that was actually in the borough that I was at. We were dispatched for an elderly gentleman whose blood pressure was very high. They wanted him taken to the hospital to have that uh, looked after. And when I got there, we carried our bags in, we carried all of our gear. And I was ready to start. And all the guys that were on the crew with me that day, we responded uh, in the engine. They said, hey, you're the new guy. You just got your card. Why don't you take primary patient care? I did not want to do that. I did not. We jumped out. We got in. We were taken back to the exam room. And there's this very nice elderly gentleman just sitting calmly in his wheelchair with his hands folded across his chest. And he had a caregiver with him. And I knew that the first thing I needed to do was ask him some questions, and I needed to take a full set of vital signs. And so I opened the bag to the, to the pocket where the blood pressure cuff always lives. But on this day, the blood pressure cuff was sitting on the table back at the firehouse. So I said, well, you've got to be prepared for anything that comes at you, right? Adapt, overcome, improvise. And so they have, you know, you think about a doctor's office, they have those blood pressure cuffs on the wall, but they're attached to the wall, and the cord on them is about three inches long, and the patient is on the other side of the room, 
So here we are trying to wheel the patient over closer to the blood pressure cuff, trying to take um, the cuff down and use it. The nurse comes in to ask if we needed anything, and it had to look like something out of the Marx Brothers. Here's these four firemen in, in our turnout pants, because that's how we always responded to calls, in our turnout pants, just pulling cords and trying to get the patient up against the wall and never did go to blood pressure that day. But I said to myself after that, I said, well, whew, if that's the worst thing that could ever happen, I think I could deal with that. But in a decade of doing emergency medicine, I have found every situation that I thought I was prepared to deal with can go sideways on a moment's notice. Like the patient who had just tripped and fall, fell in his home, and we thought we were just taking him in to get a, an x-ray, make sure he hadn't you know, really hurt anything, and he decided to let his heart stop in the back of the ambulance. Wasn't ready for that one. Our lives, I find, are in some ways kind of similar to this. We have a very specific way that we see the world functioning. We say the world needs to work in this way. We have these what are called definitions or assumptions, psychological literature will call it. And when those things get broken or pushed sideways, when the definitions get warped or when the assumptions get shattered, we're left with a sense of shock. We may think to ourselves in our definitions that the world is essentially a good, stable place. People are essentially good, reasonably stable people, and that God is good. But then when those definitions get morphed and warped, when those assumptions get shattered, how do we react? How do we feel? What is our first impulse? For Job, he is a man who is described as being upright, blameless, righteous, a good man, the best man you can find in the land. He is the greatest guy. And if we were to read through chapter 1 before we jump to chapter 2, we find out that God and the Satan, and we have to just take one quick little literary note here. Satan in Hebrew means something very akin to district attorney. The word actually means prosecutor. But it's the guy who works in the divine counsel of God's workers who acts as, you know, the Sam Waterston character from Law and Order. And that's what he's doing here with Job. So in chapter 1, God and the Satan have this conversation. And when Satan goes out, he doesn't just strike Job with sores on his body. He first strikes down all of Job's animals all of his camels and all of his sheep and all of his goats, which was all of his wealth. Back in the day, they didn't have bank accounts. They had animals. And then he strikes down all of his servants, all the people that work in Job's very large household. And then finally, the Satan strikes dead Job's seven sons and three daughters and leaves Job by himself with his wife. And we fast forward what we heard today in chapter 2 that the Satan comes back, it seems, a second time and he strikes him with these horrible sores and he's itching and it's terrible. But in chapter 1, after all of this calamity strikes this really, really good guy, Job's first words were, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now think to yourself, if you've ever had an assumption shattered, a definition warped, was that the first thing that you said? I've had these situations come up to me in my own life. And I will be perfectly honest, that is not the first thing that I said. There was something about God, but it wasn't blessed are you, oh God. Because our definitions have suddenly changed without our permission. And again, Job in chapter 2, when his wife says, how can you just praise God in the midst of this? We've lost our children. We've lost our fortune. We've lost our farm. We've lost our livelihood. We've lost our servants. We've lost everything. And you're a good man, Job. I know what you do. You go and you offer sacrifice, not only for yourself, but for the children. You take care of other people. You're a good guy, Job. How can you say praise God? 
And Job's response is kind of interesting. He says, well, should we only take the blessings that we're given and just completely ignore all the bad stuff? Should we only look on the bright side of life and not interact with the bad stuff that happens to us at times? How are we supposed to react? Now, as you keep reading through Job, up to where we'll hear next week, Job has these three friends that come to visit him. With friends like Job's, you don't need enemies. His friends are not at all helpful. Well, they are for seven days. They sit silently and let Job stew in his grief and in his anger, in his frustration. And then after seven days, they all start to open their mouths. And they say, Job, you must have done something wrong. Or, you know, Job, your kids were really kind of snots and they deserve this anyway. But Job finally, I'm glad he does, he finally breaks down in the text and he starts to wonder. Wait a second here. He starts asking big kind of questions like, well, why is it that it seems that the righteous, the good, are harmed? But it's the evil, it's the bad people. They always seem to get away with it. Job's wondering how such a good person such as himself, much like the psalm author that we heard this morning, I'm good, I'm righteous, I'm holy, I do that which is pleasing to God. I deserve good things. But in a natural world that has natural consequences and natural things, and natural people. The good doesn't always happen. And so we are left with this bad stuff. Does this bad stuff come from God? Well, the book of Job wants to say yes, it does. But we have to make another little literary note. The book of Job is... An exaggerated irony. It's trying to argue against a very specific form of thought that existed in that region of the world. It was called, well, we call it today, the Deuteronomistic theology. That basically said, if you're a good person who does good things, God will bless you and no bad will ever come to you. We still have this form of theology today. It is called the prosperity gospel. If you put enough money into God, like a vending machine, you'll get back out whatever you want. If you pray enough, if you have faith enough, if you trust enough in God, then only good things will happen to you and no bad will ever befall you. Think about yourself. How many of you would describe yourself as being unfaithful, unrighteous, bad, or evil? Exactly. And you're probably being very honest. Really. I trust you. But also think about yourself. Has anything bad ever happened to you? Well, yeah. You ever get a diagnosis from a doctor you didn't really like? Ever have somebody beloved in your life die suddenly? Ever lose a job for no reason? Ever have a relationship just fall apart? No matter what you tried, no matter what you did, it just fell apart. And yet that was in spite of all of your goodness, all of your righteousness, all of your faithfulness to God. God was not the author of your destruction. God was not the author of your suffering. That is the response, that is what happens naturally in a broken world. We are broken people, the world is a broken place and broken stuff happens. And it happens beyond our control. It happens without our consent. Nobody who has ever been in the path of a hurricane or a tornado said, gee, I really hope a hurricane comes tomorrow. Gee, I really hope that tornado smacks my house. This stuff happens in a world that we live in. So 
So what does our faith matter then? It's not getting us anything, right? We have faith and we pray and we read our scriptures and we believe in God and we try our best each day to be a good person who does good things. And yet bad stuff still seems to happen to us. So what's the value of having faith? What does it get us? We can't think about our faith transactionally. That's dangerous. And that's not how faith works. If we think about our faith transactionally, then we'll think that if I have a lot more faith, then God will give me a lot more good stuff and bad stuff can't happen. That's that really screwed up notion of this thing called prosperity gospel. Because in that notion, when bad stuff happens to you, it's your fault. It's your fault you got cancer. It's your fault you lost your job. It's your fault your spouse of 50 years died. It's your fault because you just didn't have enough faith. If you would have just had a little bit more faith, if you just would have given a little bit more money to God, if you would have been a little bit more devoted in your walk, then none of this bad stuff would have happened. But that's simply untrue. That's not how the world works. That's not how a natural world works. In a natural world, bad stuff happens. People die. Bad stuff happens. And we can try our hardest to prevent it. But it's still going to happen. I had a professor in, in college who was probably the healthiest person I'd ever met. He's a bit of a freak. And he said, health is only the slowest possible rate at which you can die. We all going to die of something. And I personally would like to be a little fat, dumb, and happy when I do. So I'm going to have that second slice of pie. I don't want to get to the end of my life. You know, we hear about these famous stories from history of, of leaders who, who at their, on their deathbed are, are worried, I didn't do enough. I, didn't. I don't want to get there and say, I should have had that second slice of pie. Of course, that would probably hasten my deathbed having the second slice of pie. But hey, I'd rather be a little fat, dumb, and happy. We can't stop some natural things. We can't interfere with them. We try, and, and we have medicine, and we have health, and we have all these things that try to prevent that, and that is good. And we should try to honor what God has given to us as a gift. But guess what? At the end of the day, bad stuff is still going to happen. So then, what does our faith matter? What does it do for us? For Job, it got him nothing. Nothing. Nothing but suffering and loss and destruction. So what does our faith even matter? What does it do? Well, the question we have to ask there is, our faith in what? Our faith in who? Our faith in a version of God that acts like a cosmic vending machine, that if we just put enough things in in the right sequence and press the right buttons, we'll get what we want? That's not going to work. Because that's not how God works. Or do we have the faith in God revealed in Scripture as the great creator? the great lover of humanity, the one who came as Jesus and was willing to die. Oh yeah, prosperity gospel friends. What do we do to explain Jesus and his death? Because in that whole scheme, faithfulness, obedience to God, gets you blessings. I think anybody could argue the fact that Jesus was very faithful and very obedient to God. And yet he still ended up dead. Hmm. Interesting. So what does our faith matter? What does it do for us? Do we have faith of the God revealed in Jesus who came to set the world right? Who came to do God's justice? To reveal God's mercy? To show the way of the world the way that God wants it to be. The way that God is actively working to make it. Not broken. Not full of hurt and pain. Not full of death. In the stories we read in Genesis, we hear of this beautiful garden. Where death doesn't even exist. Where God lives with God's people and there's nothing but flourishing. And beauty and goodness and God's righteousness and God's holiness. That's the world that God desires. That's the world that God is creating and building and making. 
And Jesus is the vehicle through which that is happening. So do we have faith? Faith in that God who is renewing and restoring and redeeming the world back to the way that God always wanted it to be. And so our faith is bigger than all the brokenness. Our faith is bigger than all of the loss and the badness and the evil. We look at the world and we say, this is not God's will. This is not God's desire for God's creation. This isn't even the best we humans can do. And so our faith is in the God revealed in and by Jesus, who is making all of this better. Who is redeeming and renewing and restoring. Do we have faith in the God who comes alongside us, who says, I will never leave you or forsake you? There is never a place in Scripture where God says, I will help you avoid bad things. I will help you get out of jail free. God says that when you walk through the darkest of valleys, I will be with you. I will walk right beside you. I will walk through the flames with you. I will always be near you when this bad stuff happens. Is our faith in that God who is always with us, no matter what comes, that God is with us. The value of our faith then is not that it helps us get out of things or get around things or avoid things, but our faith is knowing that there is something much bigger that God is up to, that God is actively working to renew and redeem and restore right now, that God is calling all of us to join God in that work, and that that bad stuff doesn't have to define our reality. It doesn't have to define our personhood. In fact, God will define it for us. God will say to us in those moments, I am with you. You are mine. I am yours. I love you. I am working to redeem and restore all of this. Does our faith go beyond that moment in time to see the world with God's eyes? Or do we just have faith in a God that's like a vending machine? A God who will keep us absorbed from bad stuff. A God who will keep us from, getting, from ever getting sick. A, a God who will help us to avoid all the bad people in the world. Or do we have a God that says, I'll be right with you when you experience the world's badness? I was with you all when Jesus experienced the worst that the world of his day could throw at him. God took on the world's brokenness in the, the act of the cross. He took on the violence and the vengeance and the evil. Do we have faith in the one who says, I am willing to take that, to take what the world has to throw it at, at me, to throw at you, do I have faith in that God? Bad stuff is going to come. Bad stuff is going to happen. We can't avoid it as much as we can, as much as we try. Why do you think we all have insurance? We have car insurance and homeowner's insurance and medical insurance. If we knew that bad stuff was never ever going to happen, we wouldn't need insurance. But we have it because we know it's always possible. Why do you wear your seatbelt in the car? Maybe because you don't want to meet a guy in a gray uniform with a gun <laughs> on the side of Route 90 or something. But think about it kind of more existentially. Why do you do that? Because you say, if something bad is to happen, I want the best possible chance. Why don't you ride a pedal bike down right Route 90? Why do you drive in a tank? made out of the best materials with 900 airbags in it. Because you know bad stuff could happen and you want to prepare for that. You have faith in the things that help to protect you. You have faith in your insurance company. You're in good hands, right? Isn't that all states thing? <laughs> That's what that deep booming voice of that uh, actor always says. We do that because 
We know bad stuff could happen. When the bad stuff comes, that's when our faith is really the most vulnerable. That's when our faith is really put uh, at issue more. We may not have that immediate response that Job had. So, you know, praise be God who takes and gives. Praise be the one. We may not have that. But can we see beyond that one set of circumstances and say, this is not the end. This is not the defining, definitional moment of my life. God is up to bigger things. And even when we're confused, when we're lost, and when we are hurt, and we're going to hear this next week more, it's okay for us to say what is on our heart, what is on our mind, what we are most frustrated and hurt by. We're going to hear Job do that. We're going to hear this happen in Mark's gospel as well. We're going to hear about these honest expressions of faith and response. And we're going to find out that it's okay to be angry sometimes. It's okay to be frustrated when the world doesn't work the way we want the world to work. I'll leave you with this. Several years ago, one of my best friends, several years before that, his father had died. And just a few uh, years ago, his mother then died. And he's about my age. And at her funeral, he got up, he's, he's a pastor, he got up and he celebrated the table. I can't believe he did that. He said something that I'll never forget. And it made sense to me at the time, and it's made sense to me in other moments. He said, the world right now doesn't make any sense. My mom just died. My dad died not long before that. And so the world to me right now doesn't make a lot of sense. But there is one place where I know I can come and receive some meaning. And receive some grace. And he said, and that, ta that place is the table of Jesus Christ. Where it doesn't have to, the world doesn't have to make a lot of sense. But here, I know I get to meet and experience the risen Jesus. Who comes alongside in whatever moment my life has. And it makes a little bit more sense again. So friends, whatever it is that you are going through in your life right now. You are invited this morning to Christ's table where we get to receive something that makes just a little bit more sense. The presence, the love, the grace, and the mercy of our God. As we gather our hearts and minds at the table, the bell choir is going to lead us in a moment of prayer with the famous hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together. So let us be in prayer as we gather our hearts and minds at this table.
As we gather this day on this World Communion Sunday with our fellow sisters and brothers all around the world, we are implored, as the hymn says, to break the bread together, to drink the cup together, to praise our God together. And so we join with our sisters and brothers wherever they are, whatever circumstance they may be under. We remember those who are very broken this day, and this table brings to them healing and grace. We think of all those who are under threat and persecution for their faith, and may this table give them peace in their land. We come together wherever we are in our own journeys of faith so that we can celebrate the supper that the Lord Christ celebrated with his disciples in a time of great tumult and pain. Friends, let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. Even when we were dust, when our story begins in dust, you were there. Your word was there, your breath into the lifeless void. And upon your word, all creation sprang into life. When we were in the wilderness, terrified, timid, you were there. Your word was there. With manna just enough for today, with water even from the driest rock, with the abundant grace upon which our story always rests. And when we fell short, slaves to power and greed, you were there. Your word was there. On the lips of prophets and in the hearts of servants, in stories of revolution and revelation and liberation, calling us even now to acts of courage and witness and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Indeed, blessed are you, O Christ, our Lord, for risking yourself among us, vulnerable and rejected, for teaching among us, teaching the radical hope of God, teaching grace to a world bent on vengeance, teaching love to a world bent on destruction, teaching peace to a world bent on tearing itself apart. You were there. Your word was there, even to the point of death itself. Even faced with terror and hatred and the brokenness of the world, you rose again to new life, to new creation, to resurrection, that we might know something other than the dust, that we might expect something other than the end, that we might work for something other than ourselves. And so you speak to us again with these abundant gifts of bread and cup, which we joyfully celebrate. You're dying and rising as we await the table of the kingdom yet to come, as we dedicate ourselves again to you, thankful and transformed, as living and holy sacrifices that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break together and the cup we share together may retell our common stories together and reshape our common bonds together and remember our common grace together in the communion of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one in whose life and death you have torn down our divisions. And so may we all be one with those who share this feast on this World Communion Sunday of all days with all your children at every place around your table. May we share this abundant cup with all who thirst for your justice. May we share this abundant bread with all those who hunger for your righteousness. May we be united with every corner of your story, united in hope, united in vision, united in purpose, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us from this table to be the body of Christ in all the world. Send us with a spirit of courage, a spirit of power and love, that we may be witnesses in all creation to the unending story of your word breathing life into the dust. Keep us faithful and fruitful, hopeful and peaceful, 
until we come at last to the one table of your kingdom, to feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm, with you and with your, your one word, through Christ and in Christ, the one who came and died for us, the one who even prays for us, the one who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that on the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus was eating with his disciples in the upper room. He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it and he gave it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. In a similar way, after the supper, it ended pouring out the cup. He said, this cup sealed in my blood is for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. Do this in memory of me. We are assured that every time we eat this bread, we drink this cup. We proclaim the saving death of the Lord until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Now let us join with our sisters and brothers all around the world at this table, this feast, as we receive these gifts from our God. Let us commune together. Friends, let us be in prayer once again. Gracious God, we offer our thanks for the whole communion of saints who witness to this feast and for the ministry of churches around the world with whom we gather today. By this broken bread, may we each be restored for the work yet to come. By this shared cup, may we each be claimed for the proclamation of your kingdom at this shared table. May we be united as children of your promise, children of your word, dying and made new again, sent boldly together into the world as servants of your peace. Amen. Friends, let us stand one last time and join our voices together. Oh, Jesus, I have promised.
We know of the one promise of God revealed in Jesus. I will never leave you or forsake you. Wherever you are, whatever happens to you, God is always there. God is working actively to redeem and restore this world. That is, in which, that is the thing in which we can have our faith. That when things happen, God is always there. Go out in peace. Amen.